Happy Saturday, guys. Happy Saturday. Am I in the right place? Happy Saturday. I know I don't normally do <clears throat> Saturday anything, <laughs> but I was sitting here and I wanted to, forgive me, I'm trying to pull up notes at the same time. Um, I wanted to literally pop in and say not only happy Saturday, but I'm here working on my book. And I wanted to come on and share, instead of wasting time on a Saturday doing any other thing, um, I wanted to kind of pop in and kind of give you guys some tidbits on how to be productive during this time. So uh, tell a friend, bring a friend, let a friend know. Um, I'm going to give out jewels and gems on how to get your first and land your first lucrative book deal. So if you've ever wanted to um, publish something, you have something that you've always wanted to put out there in the market, you've self-published before, you probably joined one of these, what I'd like to call Ring Around the Rosies um, book collaborations where 55 million of you get on a book collabo. And then the book doesn't sell and you're mad at the person who authored the book. Nobody buys the book and it doesn't really get you to what you were thinking was going to happen. For all of you who have been trying to get out there in the speaking world and you've been told that getting a, a book deal or getting your book out there is going to help you to land more gigs. And you're looking at COVID and you're saying to yourself, um, hello, Mr. Vinny, you're saying to yourself, I really want to get this done. I just don't know how to do it. Well, I got, I got, I got the sauce for you tonight. Um, like I said, I don't normally do Saturday anything, but um, I'm in, I'm not only am I in quarantine, but I'm also in, um, I've been sitting here writing my book for the last mm, four or five months. No, I probably started in, in December. Um, and then of course, quarantine kind of took me off my game a little bit in the beginning because I had to kind of readjust for uh, all the things that happened between school being shut down and planes being grounded. So I'd say four or five months collectively, but I've been writing this book for a while. So let me just give you some introspect before I even give you and drop some jewels. Like I said, this is this is not like normal my normal stuff. So let me give you some drops and jewels here. Um, I have published, let me see, let's guess. One, two, I published three horrible books, Three books that I wish that Amazon will take down. I've been begging Amazon to take them down, but they have this rule where it hit, once it hits their category and it has the ISBN number, they can't take it down. Then I published one um, book that I kind of regret, but I don't regret, but it is what it is. And then The Confidence Factor was my main book. So when I wrote The Confidence Factor, I was in a different space. My, my, my mind was like, I was ready to write. I was ready to put something out there. I would have never thought where the confidence factor would have taken me from the time I wrote it to this very day. Um, I get to, I get to lend my voice to a lot of different things. Um, I get to monetize my voice. I get to monetize my presence. I get to do a lot of different things that the first three books that were really, really bad, like they were really, really bad. <laughs> I get to do things that the first three books just was not able to afford me. In the, in the collection of The Confidence Factor, a lot of doors opened for me because I realized what I was doing in The Confidence Factor. I had something specific I wanted to talk about, something specific that was on my mind that really allowed me to open up the reservoir of financial uh, lucrative opportunities. So when I talk about speaking, the book thing did lead me to, you know, I was making money in speaking before, but I definitely quadrupled um, the amount of money I was making after I wrote The Confidence Factor. So I self-published two installments of The Confidence Factor and I sold the third one to someone else and they published that book for me. And then I sat back. And so I haven't written a book since 2016. What happened in between 2016 and now, not only I had been traveling and speaking, but around 2018 or so, I didn't feel like doing this anymore. I literally, just, when I say didn't feel like doing it, I didn't feel like writing anymore. I'm the kind of person that I always advise people, if you have nothing to say, please don't write because you'll write your worst work when you're doing that. And I had nothing to say. And I had gotten this buzz like, you should write another book. And then I said, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. 
absolutely nothing to say. I am drained of thought. I have nothing to say. And I'm still monetizing the confidence factor. So I have no financial issues at all. I'm selling two to three thousand dollars. I'm sorry, two to three thousand books each and every time I go and speak. So I'll talk about the being paid to speak in a moment. So I'm selling those like crazy. So I'm selling on an average month between ten to fifteen thousand books. So I'm not worried about it. It had been three or four years. I'm not concerned, but I knew that it was it was time. So in t- early t- 2019, I get this email, this random email, literally it's a random email from a publishing group that many of you may have a book of theirs on your shelf right about now. So it was an editor from this publishing group and she says to me, <clears throat> we wanna know about working with you to see if maybe we can collaborate on an idea. I thought they wanted me to be able to be quoted in another book that they were writing about because I had gotten word about it. That's not what they wanted. They wanted me to write my own book. The first time we had met, that was early 2019, I'd say February or so. First time we met, there was no synergy because again, I had nothing to say, I had nothing to write about, I had nothing to talk about. And we just couldn't come up with anything. And in the end, around April or so, we kind of disembarked on this idea because again, I have nothing to say. In 2018, I realized I had nothing to say. I said, let's just write out this confidence factor, figure out where it takes me. And when I feel inspired to write again, I will. It just so happens when I said, you know, we are, we, we kind of divorced each other in the exploratory part of our conversation. Something happened where I had something to say. Now I had to go back to the drawing board and figure out what can I do to get her attention back again? Because we worked for so many months to try to figure out what we can do, how, how we can make synergy. Couldn't figure it out then because I had nothing on my mind. An idea sparked and I went back to her and I said, look, let's, let's start this all over again. Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Carol and let's talk again. And we started having these conversations. We started exploring different, different ideas. And before you knew it, I came up with something that really resonated with me. It gave me the same feeling I was feeling when I wrote The Confidence Factor. Shortly thereafter, um, we were in a contract phase that was kind of strange. I had never done this before. So next thing you know, it's January of 2020. Of course, January was a, a wonderful month. You guys remember January. January was a good month. February comes. We're still talking, but I'm not sure where I stand. March comes. She calls me back. She says, I looked at the idea and I want it and I want to buy it from you. And this is how much I'm willing to give you for it. And when I sat back, we got the contract and I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're giving me all of this for this amount of work. And it was a, it's a lucrative contract. I've got uh, about another eight or nine months to finish the book. The book is almost done. Um, but I realized now that I've done all of that and I've done all the hard work in getting the book prepared and getting her interest and getting the outline ready and getting the book proposal ready. Mind you, I didn't plan on doing this. This wasn't like a plan. Like I just told you, 2018, I gave up on the book idea because I had nothing to say. By 2019, I'm being pitched to do it and I'm still not feeling it until I have an idea that I want to do. But then I realized what I did wrong in 2019 was I said no because I realized I didn't have the proper materials to be able to work with a publisher, especially a publisher of this magnitude. We're talking Wall Street Journal kind of publishing. So we're at a different level when we're at that stage. Now, my book will be out in November 2021, so I can't give you any details until March. I promise you, I saw the cover. It's beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It's like my own baby. (laughs) Um, But in the interim of that, I realized that it now puts me in a different position. Now, when I wrote The Confidence Factor, yes, I got a lot of publicity. Yes, I've sold a lot of books. Yes, it it, it was a great run while it was there. And it's still a great run for me. And I'm still selling a lot of books. And I'm still getting a lot of opportunities, even though I'm in the middle of shutdown, just the same way you may be. However, what has changed is... Now I understand the philosophy of getting a publisher and getting an editor on your side, how to negotiate an offer, how to write to an editor and how to be able to discuss with them what your idea is. Instead of sitting back and say, my name is Kara, I want to write a book, like how to present to a publisher of that magnitude. It takes a totally different set of languages. It takes a totally different set of thought so that you can be able to have them do all of the major work for you. When I say the major work, they're taking care of the editing, 
They're taking care of the, the, the byline. They're taking care of the Amazon. They're taking care of the royalties. They're taking care of everything. They're taking care of how the, uh, how the outline has to be. We already worked through the back cover. They're taking care of the artwork. Like all of those things that you have to do as a self-published author, they're taking care of it. Oh yes, did I say they paid me already? So all of that is already taken care of. So to be able to say, wow, I'm working with this publisher. You'll see when you see the book cover. I'll talk to you guys about that later. But when you get to see all of that, and I get the team that comes with them, so I don't have to labor in that. I am just a resource. I come up with the knowledge, I write the stuff out, boom, I send it over to your team. Your team works graphics, they do all the other zhuzhing, they work out the deals with all of the major publications, they work out the deals with Wall Street Journal, New York Times, they work out the galley copies, and I just got to sit back and run and get ready because i know by the time this book publishes it may publish a little bit early but the tentative date that is supposed to hit the market is november 23rd 2021 um, and the reason is because the time frame from the time that my book is actually going to be with my editor which should be in another few weeks until it hits the market in 2021 that's the time they're using to sell so they're they're already pre-selling i don't have to do anything they're pre-selling, they are contacting media. I don't have to do anything other than put myself and show up in this seat and make it work. Now, this is not as hard as it looks. So for those of you who've been like, how do I get a publisher to work with me? And should I go self-publish and this, that, the other, especially now, why I think it's important now is because we're all in quarantine or we're all in some type of shutdown. The, the, the world as we knew it is not open the way it was. And what you should be doing is focused on building revenue. Now, this book has already become a source of revenue and I haven't even seen it yet. All I have is a manuscript that is on my computer that you cannot come and take from me. <laughs> um, that's all I have. So all the other labor that is involved in it comes after I publish the book. And then, of course, by then, hopefully, if the world is open back up, I go back on tour, I get back out there, and I have a long range set of marketing. This is possible without you having to labor in the, I've got to publish it, I've got to market it, I've got to go out and book to it. Like, you shouldn't be paying for any of this stuff. This stuff should be afforded to you because you're just that brilliant and you can do this. So I'm going to give you the what not to do first because I'm not going to give you the what to do because if you do what not to do, if you eliminate that off of your list first, then what happens is when you get to a level where you have something to say, like I said, I had nothing to say until 2018. When you have something to say and it hits you and you say, man, I want this story to get out there, then you can learn how to publish it with a publisher. The, fir the first thing you have to understand is working with a major publisher like a Simon & Schuster or Riley and stuff like that, credibility, <laughs> you can't buy that. And it's hard to get that as self-published. You can get it, don't get me wrong, but let somebody else do some of the work for you and take that labor off you because I still have other things to do. I still got investments. I got other things I got to do. I just need to write the stuff and you guys work on the other stuff. I don't, I can't do all of it. I can't be the chief cook and bottle washer. So if you decide that this is the time for you to be able to write, and this is the time for you to be able to score a deal, and even in this pandemic, like what I'm scared about is that people are worried so much about the pandemic that they're not making any money during the pandemic, and I picked up my check during the pandemic, you could do this during this pandemic, but you have to learn what not to do. And I'm gonna give you just a few simple things that I need you to consider because before you say, I'm going to go pitch myself to Simon and Schuster, the first thing you need to do, I'm going to give you some little things you need not to do before you get yourself out there. Because I, I need y'all to realize this is not a one size fits all kind of thing. So tell a friend, bring a friend, and I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> okay, number one, you can't pitch your life story. This is going to be a hard one. So I realize all of you may have something that happened in your life, something that's traumatic, something that is heartfelt, something that you think that the world needs to learn from. And I get it. Whether it's domestic violence, the death of a family member, um, depression, heartbreak, there's a lot. Don't get me wrong. I'm not discounting what you're going through or what you have been through. But a life story is different when you don't have a backing behind it of a major, major organization. And what I mean by that is, I'm, again, I'm not discounting your story, but it's just something I have learned over this course of this time. Editors, 
care less about your life story if you're not famous of a certain caliber. So if you're not Jackie Onassis or Oprah Winfrey, your life story is not interesting because they don't know how to pitch it to other brokers in the area. They can't figure out how to be able to pitch it. So if you want a publisher, if you want an editor to look at it, you cannot pitch your life story. Hello, Miss Monique. You can't pitch your life story. So I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but for all of you who have been saying, I need to get my story out there, my story, my story. S slow down on the story for a second. Hold on to your story and find what problem you solved in your story and write a pitch about this, the problem that you solved. And that's the basis of your book. We'll write the life story later. But right now you need to get the accreditation. You have no accreditation. So you can't be out here saying, I need people to read my life story. So what, where I get confused in that is that if you don't have an audience already, and when I say an audience, an audience who is into that life story, it's tough. The only exception to the life story rule is if your life story has already been covered by the media. Let me give you an example. There is a young lady, and I cannot remember her name, not for anything. But there's a young lady who was kidnapped some years ago. I remember I was a kid when I heard about this. This was in Pennsylvania. She was kidnapped um, coming home from school. And imagine she lived about five or six blocks away from her real parents. And her the people who kidnapped her had her, you know, five or six blocks away. And they were always on the news. We're still searching for this little girl, such and such. If you see her, da 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 And they keep doing that over and over again. So every day for 16 years, she keeps seeing on television that they're looking for the body of this little girl because they're presuming that she had died. Come to find out, one day when she gets a little older, she happens to see a baby picture of herself with her kidnapped parents, and then she really discerns that this is her. So they're looking for me. So that's a life story. So when she went and sold her story, it was because for 18 years, she had seen herself on television where they're like, we're still looking for the body of da 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 and not knowing she was the person they were looking for. It just so happened, if she didn't open that book, she would not have seen that that was her in the, in the on the news because she didn't recognize herself as a baby. She'd never seen baby pictures of herself. She went to school, she was loved, she had a different name. Now that's a life story. You, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be facetious when I say this. You were a, a victim of domestic violence. It's a common story. And, and I'm not discounting it, but it's a common story. Publishers are not interested in that because it's like, did anybody cover it? Did, did, did we look at it on the news? Was it in a newspaper? Yeah, like Elizabeth Smart. That's a perfect other example. But there are a lot of others that are like that have, that have been kidnapped. They've got a story to tell where I'm not disrespecting any of you who want to tell your life story, but your idea for a, a, an editor has to be what's the lesson in the life story and then teach it through that scenario. You can't go into, I was kidnapped and I was a victim of domestic violence. And then they're going to be like, because editors really don't care. I'm sorry to tell you that. Wait, wait till you talk to them. You really understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. They're like, um, so you were kidnapped then, <laughs> you know, unless it was covered by someone. That's how they offer you book deals. They don't offer you book deals because of the fact that you just got something to talk about. So don't do that. I've got a story to tell. I've got my life story. My life is very interesting. I think everybody can agree at some point that their life is interesting, whether you've had a great life or a horrible life or experienced something, but something has to be different about yours and people have to already kind of know the story of your life so like i said with the young girl that i grew up looks listening to i literally used to see the story all the time where they were looking for the body of this kid the kid saw herself on television that's the kind of story what that i'm talking about okay the second thing is not having a marketing plan the one thing you don't want to go to an editor with is a great pitch and no marketing plan they're not going to be the ones doing, doing all the marketing for you. You have to have a marketing plan. And they call it a 24-month run. So my publisher said, I got to have a 24 to 36-month run of how you're going to publish this book and keep it in the market relevant until your next work, if I decide to write another book. They bought five years worth of my book already in advance, but for two years, I've got to be on the run, is what they call it.
What that means is for two years, I have to have a full marketing plan. So when you're posting and pitching to publications and publishers, editors are going to, the first thing they're going to ask you for, it's in the pitch deck. So what's the uh, marketing plan? You can't do this. I got 4,000 people on the social media. You can't do that. That's not, that's not, a, that's not a marketing plan. That's your, your 4,000 people who like you on the social media. Um, we're talking about a real marketing plan. How do you plan on getting out there? So I already have my marketing plan for 2021, 2022, and 2023 already done. And what that means is I'm already booked to speak in 2023, most of 2022, and the day that the book comes out in 2021. I had to already have those things in place so they knew that the moment that I had the book in my hand, physically had the book in my hand, I'm on the run. So I started only pitching to events. Notice I have not been really on the speaking circuit for the last two or three months because I'm only pitching to events in 2021 on purpose. I need this time to really focus on the book and the book itself because I've got a fiduciary commitment. So if I've been absent from people's lives, I apologize, but it's just because I've got to be on this 2021, 2022, and 2023 trip. So I'm not really concerned with what's going on in 2020. I don't even hear half the stuff that's going on in 2020. I know we got COVID. I know we got social unrest. I know we have racial unrest, but I also have a book to publish. So I'm like, okay, so we're only focusing on things that are going to make me money in 2021. That may sound a long way to you, but it's not because you can get paid in book dollars now for two years from now. So I've been booking for 2023 and even I've gotten some offers for 2024. When you're speaking on major corporate stages, they've already planned for 2027. So if you're really smart, you work with an organization that you can get rotation from now until the date your book publishes and you let them know in advance. You say to them, you know, I've got a book that's coming out on this date. Then they're like, okay, well, our event hits on that date. The next time we bring you in, let's work on how we're going to pay you in book dollars. And that is how you really create a marketing plan where you got that two-year run out. Um, and out of the 4,000, only five will buy it. I, look, let me tell you something, um, Ms. Simonia. I don't do social media <laughs> at all. I have stopped that. Because the thing is, I can't depend on social media. It's in inconsistent. First of all, I ha then that means I have to depend on an algorithm to depend on visibility. And then I have to buy ad shares to be able to get your visibility. And then if you don't buy it, like, it, it's a gamble. As opposed to if I sell in 2021, 2022, I don't have to worry about that. I make four phone calls and I got that taken care of. So that's why I said you cannot go to a publisher and say, hey, publisher, for two, for two years, I'm going to just build my Facebook and Instagram follower. You can't do that. What's your plan? Where are you going? Who are you going to? Who are you going with? Do you have a team? Um, who do you plan on speaking to? Who do you plan on speaking in front of? Where do you plan on getting this particular message out to? Like, how, how, how can we get this there? If you don't have that, publishers are not really interested. So you don't really want to to kind of get into that that particular spectrum. And that leads me to my next point. You can't speak at low level events, point blank, period. Um, like we're done. I haven't spoken at a low level event in many years, probably more like seven, eight, nine years, something like that. And I don't speak at public events of that magnitude because they don't bring any value. It's always the push and pull of people who are only there because of either who's speaking or the cost. I'm only at industry specific events. That's where I've been speaking for the last amount of years. It has brought me enough value where I don't have to worry. That's why I said I can sell myself for 2022, 2023, and even some in 2024 because I've been with the same production companies over and over, building those relationships and really building um I say building an in with them so I can really, you know, they, they always want to work with me. So I'm, I make it such that I'm easy to work with. You know, if any time you need somebody to fill in, look, I'm speaking at the ASA next week. They, they move their, all their Vegas um, stuff all, all the way to virtual. And I just, but we did the first part of it yesterday, all, all day yesterday. It was a long day. And then I do the next part of it later next week. I think it publishes and I go live on Friday. 
Um, I've worked with the ASA. The ASA stands for American Staffing Association. I've worked with the ASA now for two years, and I'm going to work with them next year. Oh, wait a minute. I'm also working with them in 2022. Did you know that? How do you secure that? You build relationships with the same people so that, and I, they already know the book is coming, so they're well aware. I've already put my publisher in, in contact with them so that they know when you retain Carol in 2022, depending on the date, We'll make sure that the books are already there for you in case we open up the world and the economy again. Um, we, When you hire her, she'll be part of just not only a speech, but she'll be also giving away books. We'll be working with you to work with the books. So my publisher will work with them two years from now. Do I have to do that? No. All of that is taken care of for me. So you need to make sure you have that. Okay. The next thing that publishers don't like is when you don't have any way to secure bulk orders. Um, so the confidence factor did well for me in my my life because I've only sold bulk, bulk orders. I can't depend on one sale, one sale, one sale. Um, every event I've ever spoken at in the last maybe four years, they had to buy two to 3,000 books a piece. Um, I've sold 10,000 at one organization. I sold 20000 to another organization. We've had them shipped. If you don't work on your bulk sales, this is going to be a problem. It's going to be a twofold problem. It's not just a one-fold problem. It's a twofold problem. Number one, you can make the New York Times bestseller list by just doing bulk orders. That's the way that all the other big boys and girls do it. So that's the first thing. If you want to hit the New York Times and get off the cheap Amazon 99 cent pinwheel, it's like so at some point we got to grow up out of this. We got we can't we can't be doing a kindergarten 99 cent I'm a, I'm an Amazon bestseller forever. We got to we got to grow up. So in order for you to get to the New York Times, you've got to sell bulk orders and they got to prove it. So they have their own scantron that lets them know how many bulk orders were sold. So you try to encourage the same people you speak for or other organizations who you want to work with to buy in quantities that have commas. That's the incentive. They can work with the publisher and they get a bulk discount. You don't work on that. That is for you to be able to sell the most amount of books. Publishers like to hear that you've done bulk sales. So when I wrote back to this particular publisher and I said, oh, I've sold 40,000 books in bulk sales in one year. And they said, prove it. And I print and I prove. They're like, wait a minute. Oh, okay. She knows how to sell some bulk books. I sell bulk books all the time. I'm not selling to you guys. Unfortunately, I don't mean any offense, but I don't sell to you guys. I only sell to those parts of the world that are willing to buy two, three thousand books at a time. I'm not interested in one. And yeah, y'all put my butt. No, 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 no. I don't have time for that. So every time I sell, a, every time I sell myself, if you see me in a dress with a microphone and a lot of makeup, best believe there was a bulk order sale in the background someplace. So it was my regular check and a lot of books. So what they'll do is they'll say, we intend to have, um, let's say a thousand people at this event. And we have a thousand people who cannot attend that they registered for and we want to give them away as gifts. So that's 2,000 books sold right there. I'm trying to make sure that I sell more books than myself, meaning my fee is my fee and I need the commas to be able to accelerate the book commandment. And the book commandment is so that I don't have to worry if this book is selling. So for those of you who are always looking at Amazon and seeing what number placement you're on, that's because you're selling one at a time. When you're doing bulk, bulk sales, that Scantron goes a totally different way. I don't know the, the formula behind that. That's not something that I can't tell you about. But it's easier to prove to a publisher that you know what you're doing. Now, you don't have to do 40,000 books like I've done in 2019. You could do 3,000 books as long as they know you know how to sell in bulk. That's it. This is like going to Costco for books. You're not here for one roll of toilet tissue. All of your head. <laughs> Don't make it crazy. If you go in there to buy the big, 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 big roll. You, you go in. Look, I have a car and a big, 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 big truck. When I go with the one, I have to pull the lever down. It's because I went for real toilet tissue. We went to load up. Right? When I go with the car, oh, it's a little jar of milk. When I go with the truck, it's because I go in and fill up for weeks and weeks at a time. What you want publishers to know is that you know how to sell. Now, how you, because I know y'all going to ask me in a second. How do you do the mix between 
Carol, what's your speaking fee? And why would you sell books? It's much more profitable to sell books because I'm going to get that royalty check anyway. Plus, I got my royalty check already. Plus, I'm getting paid to speak. Why would I want just a speaking fee? Are you crazy? Are you mad? So I'm going to get a check in, at the end of the month. I'm going to get a check from the publisher and I'm going to get a speaking fee to be here. Math. It's just math. It's just simple math. So if I sold 2,000 books, depending on if I sold just below retail, and then I get that royalty check from that, and then I get a fee from that because I get a fee from the royalty sale, and then I'm getting my regular fee, which still has a comma. All of these commas add up. It's my money. I earned it all. So why would I not want to do that? Another thing you can do is just sell books in quantity. You don't even have to ask for a speaking fee. You just got to literally say, if somebody asks you what's your speaking fee, my speaking fee is 5,000 books. And do it seriously. See how I just did that? My speaking fee is 5,000 books. And you mean it. <laughs> you mean it. Um, yeah, you got to upscale. It's literally, I, I I believe in every way I've ever spoken, including Facebook. I've spoken for Facebook. Yes, check the receipts. December, I spoke for all 20,000 people. Books. That's how you do it. Um, so you, you want to make sure that you're always trying to sell books at all times. Okay, another thing you need to do. Please hire somebody to write your bio. Your bio could be the difference between you getting in and getting out. Meaning, a lot of times when you have a self-written bio, you leave things out because you think it's not important, as opposed to having a professional read your bio and just determine what's important and what's not important. Now, I have a bio for you guys that is totally different than the people who are hiring me. The bio for you guys just reflects what you need to see. That's, that's just what you need to see. Most of you are not hiring me anyway. So it just reflects what you need to see. The people who are hiring me, they have a totally different bio that's written by somebody different. It is not written by me because if a bio was written by me, I can tell it was written by me because it says a lot about me. It says, I put this in and I left this out. I put this in, I've left this out. Well, other people need to see the full thing to determine what works for them. So you have to determine what works for them. You can leave off something that you think is very minor and that's major for somebody who's hiring you. So for example, I wrote an article for Cosmopolitan Magazine, I can't tell you how many years ago, I think it was 2012, 2013. It's irrelevant to me, but I can't tell you how many publishers I have actually talked to over the years, as well as magazine reps that are like, that article is life-changing. I got on the Today Show because of that article. It's an article. It's literally 710 words. It's one article. I can't even find it. It was in the physical magazine, but it meant something to the people who read it. So I have people who only write the bios for me because when I write my bio, I leave that article off. Why? Possibly because I over, I'm overly critical of myself, maybe, I don't know. So in order for me not to over criticize, let somebody else do it that sees the best in me and they can take that to the next level. You need a short bio and a long bio. The long bio has to have those things in it. And again, don't tell people what to take out. Let them interview you, let them have a moment with you to decide what's important for your bio. But don't, can I beg you? Don't write it yourself. You're, you're pitching for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 grand. Don't write the bio yourself. Just don't, because it sounds like you, right? If you want that kind of money, please um, don't write it yourself. Just stay away from, yeah, hire somebody. You're going to make money anyway, so don't worry about it. Hire somebody to write your bio. And when you hire that person to write your bio, tell them what it is for. I specifically hired someone, and I told them it was for a publisher, and they knew what to do. And so when she sat down with me, she said, tell me about your life from 2010 to now. I just went for it and she just started writing. I had nothing to do with it. So that bio is what worked. You do not write these bios yourself. And also don't get people who you already know that know you to write your bio because they're smart. Like, don't do that. It has to be somebody who sees a different version of you. Like I said, I tend to leave this article off of all bios. Most people can't even find that article. But that's because it's me criticizing me. It's because that was a different time in my life when I was writing like that, when I sounded like that. But that article has opened up doors in places where I never thought I'd get to. 
And like I said, that article led me to the Today Show. That le- article led someplace else. And it's because somebody else said, you need to include that because that led you here. That got you here. So it has an apex and you got to include that. So let them do it. Don't take any sides in that. Okay. Next, no media plan. <clears throat> no media plan. <laughs> Simple as plan. No media plan. Um, a media plan is how do you intend to get in the media's highlight, highlight reel when you publish this book? Um, how do you how are you going to get on the news? You don't want to be on your local news. How do you get on all the news media? How do you get somebody to be talking about your book? Also, within your media plan, how do you get the media to endorse your book? So I have been working with different media outlets to get them to see the manuscript already to give me an endorsement. You need a media plan. Make sense? <coughs> Excuse me. All right. I talked about social media because I'm not going to do that again. <sighs> And last but not least, a failure to say you want your payments up front. So when I talk about payments up front, you want your royalties up front. You don't want to waste time with saying, I don't need it. I don't want it. You want your royalties up front. And that's simple. And that's how you, those are the things you don't do. (coughs) Excuse me. Those are the things you don't want to do right about now. All the things you want to avoid in order for you to get a publisher to start calling you back. You want to avoid all these little things. Don't play small. Don't play cheap. A media plan, you have to have a media plan. Nobody's going to give you 40, 50 grand in your hand and you have no media plan either. <coughs> They'll look at you strange like, okay, so you have no media plan. So you're going to take my 40 grand and you're just going to put it in your pocket in your bank account and you think that's it? Use that money to reinvest in yourself. It's simple as plain. Like a lot of times what I find is people want the money, but they don't think, well, how, how, what, what, what should I be doing with it? Because if you want the money and you want to 10x your value and you want to get to stages where they're paying you 30, 40, 50 grand to speak, you got to have a media plan in your back pocket. Again, I'm not trying to, to, to label myself in a di- totally different way, but I haven't played the Facebook game very well. I haven't played the Facebook game because I've moved off of here. I stay on LinkedIn and I play the game a different way over there. I've always played this whole, I'm selling bulk books in the background. I'm not doing media right now. I haven't done media in 2020 because I got this to write and the media really is just not something I'm interested in right now. I really want to focus on this because I don't want to give it away. And the next thing you know, 2021 hits and it's on my back. Like I got to come back with this whole thing. But you've got to have that in your back pocket. So building relationships with different producers, building relationships with different media outlets, building relationships with different celebrities that can get you on the inside. you got to have a media plan. Um, should you start with blogs and then books? You can start either way. I wouldn't say the blog has ever helped me for that. The, my blogs have helped me to get booked on stages. I'm not necessarily sure if the blogs have helped me to... Um, to get the book deal, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it hasn't leaned a little bit because I have a, enough of a platform between Inc. and Entrepreneur and Forbes where I can write about myself a little bit or I can have another writer cover me because I am a writer already there. Um, I would say this. If the blog means enough to you, turn it into a podcast use the podcast to be able to inform a network that doesn't know you because you need a totally different group of people who are willing to buy from you. Inform the podcast that, hey, got this book that I'm working on. So that you're not spending too much time on the blogs. Spend your time focusing on the podcast. Let people know what you're writing about. Ask them for their input. Ask them for their insights and let them kind of get in with you on that. And you can use your podcast visibility to be able to sell the media, the part of the media plan that's going to help you to be able to grow because podcasts are media now, but it has to be a podcast that's growing. Another thing is too, also in your media plan, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you this. If you can book yourself on podcasts that have high visibility, you're good to go. So, you know, I'm very picky about where I put my name. Um, yeah, yeah, Vinny, don't get me. No, I could read your mind. <laughs> um, but yeah, podcasts are very, um, they're very lucrative, but you also, like I said, you don't want to, if you're going to, you, if when you start yours, it's one thing. If you're going to be on any, it has to be reputable. 
So I don't say yes to a lot of interviews. I say, I, I actually ignore a lot of people and some, some people may have be on here and maybe I have ignored you and it's not personal. Um, but it's just, it has to be, it can, I can't waste time right now. I, I just can't. I'm not wasting time with your podcast that is just on your website or whatever. I, it has to be of a certain caliber because it's part of my media plan. So like I said, during this time, I've been very intentional about staying away from certain platforms because I'm not being funny when I say this, but Facebook cannot give me what I need for my book to grow. Does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? It just can't. Um, it's not where my book needs, it's, it's not the seed I need right now. I need to be on LinkedIn. I need to be visible on LinkedIn. I need to play the LinkedIn game. I need to be connected on LinkedIn. And that's how I, I grow my podcast and every other aspect. Because nobody's reading my ink articles here. Like, I don't think y'all are, but <laughs> you might not be. Um, they've already told us. It's like nobody's reading them on, on Facebook. So don't publish them there. So it's just I play where I, I need to play. Do I have any other questions? Do y'all have any other questions? Do y'all have anything y'all need to know? These are the what not to do's. So for any of you who have been thinking, I need a book deal. I need somebody to pay me for my book. Okay? I just gave you all the things not to do. Don't. Don't write your life story. Please don't. If you're sitting down writing your life story, get, get a piece of, of, the, of, 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 of paper or another sheet or another page. Go in some other direction. Ain't nobody wants your life story. It's not big enough yet. Save the life story for when the first book becomes your bestseller. Then when people are like, they can't get enough of you. They can't, they can't believe this. You taught them a lesson. Then you flip the life story on them to be able to put as an annex so that they know where it came from. But you cannot tell a life story so early. Please make sure you have a media plan. It just is... Um, Miss Monique, if, let me tell you something. A lot of times we say yes to things because we have this way of thinking, exposure, 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 expose, expose. And what we end up doing is we're exposing ourselves to wasting time. No wasting time. And I'm going to say this and I'm going to say this with all my fullness in it. The people who are actually going to give you that kind of money, they're watching you. And if you're wasting time going on non-reputable platforms, they'll pull the check from you too. They're watching you. They don't have time to waste time because you want to waste time being exposed. So you have to make sure that you are only taking on things that make sense for what you are giving out into the world. So don't spend too much time saying yes because this one has 5,000 followers and don't say yes to that it has to be in the direction of where you want to be I have been very honest and vocal about the fact that I say no because it's not in the direction I want I don't want to be and I know that I'm being watched I know that those people are watching me at all times so if I'm wasting time saying yes to the Girl, get your mind right podcast, and it's not going to lead anywhere. You got four followers. It has been four followers for 10 years, and it's not growing. The immediate problem my, my publisher is going to have is what the heck were you doing there? Because you're not allowing us to sell books. We are in the business of giving you money so you can go out here and sell books. You are the caricature. You got all this money for selling books. We don't need you on a podcast where four people going to listen. That's not the way this works. So you have to discern what is it that you need to do to be in the most reputable places that are going to help you to be able to grow. You cannot waste time. That's why I'm not wasting time. It's either you don't do them at all or you do them and they definitely are going to add to your reputable value and it's going to increase your financial value. So that's the only thing that, that's to consider. How valuable do you think LinkedIn is? LinkedIn is 10 times more valuable than this. You don't see me here. Go to LinkedIn and check my page. I got too much going on LinkedIn. This is not, look, this is where <clears throat> Facebook is where people agree with you. This is where your constituency is. This is where people, they like to, they like to like you. They like to unlike you. They like to, you know, this is where this takes place. <clears throat> you can get visibility here and that's great, but you don't get paid here. You go to LinkedIn, you do a totally different set of parameters on LinkedIn, and if you play the LinkedIn game right, the people who are in control 
of everything that you really want between the podcast editors, the news editors, the news anchors, the relationships you need to build. They're on LinkedIn. They don't play Facebook. And when they do, they're not here because of you. They're here to connect with their family and friends. And so that that producer from that ABC network is on Facebook connecting and showing you pictures of their dog. On LinkedIn, they're looking at your profile. So if your profile is not top notch, and written from a place of, I really am hungry, I'm ready to go, then you're gonna miss it. And if you keep saying what you say on Facebook, <clears throat> if you say it on LinkedIn, you're gonna lose the opportunity anyway because they realize you're not even coming up with something original for a professional platform. So I don't play the same game here that I play on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where I go to really make those types of deep-seated connections that are helping me to be able to grow a real company. Facebook is where I am to engage because unfortunately <clears throat> you can't engage that much on LinkedIn. So you have to know where you are, but your, your, your producers, your media people, your publicists, your PRP, they're not hanging out here. And the few that are, they're only here to show you a picture of their kid, their dog and their car. So you got to play LinkedIn a little bit better. Um, and so how important is LinkedIn? <clears throat> Excuse me. LinkedIn is very important. You, and I don't have COVID, so y'all that is going to say that. I have allergies now, LOL. <laughs> um, <clears throat> LinkedIn is your lifeline. It's your lifeline. Um, it is the difference between who's going to see you and what, they, what, they, what matter they're going to have in your, the growth of your business. If you've been chasing this book dream for years and years and years it's because you're not playing over there long enough, you should have at least five to 10,000 followers and maybe 3,000 friends, connect, continue to engage, but you have to be consistent on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is not like Facebook. Facebook, you could be inconsistent and still be relevant. LinkedIn, you gotta be consistent every day. Um, and you have to be consistent in your messaging. Where here, you, look, if I don't post for five, six days, y'all not gonna miss me. I'm, I'm gonna be all right. Um, but on LinkedIn, you don't engage. People are like, oh, well, I guess she's not serious. Well that's where you lose them. So you, you need to really get into that. And <clears throat> I see the value for sure. Um, yeah, Facebook, um, Facebook for real estate is pretty good, but Facebook for opportunities, and you have to know what platform works for what. Facebook as a platform for real estate, this is the place to be. So for you and me, Facebook works in this market and I can inbox a lot of people and get a lot of answers. But when it comes to publishing this book, this is not gonna work here. I'd have to buy a lot of ad spend for it to work here. And the ROI on the ad spend is gonna be very low. As opposed to LinkedIn, I can definitely go in there, pop up, say, you know, my new book is out, people will support, people wanna get in, you know, podcasting. Like a lot of podcasters are hanging out on LinkedIn. So they'll be like, oh my gosh, you got a new book. It happens to be about this. I want to know. Blah, 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 blah. And I can really engage where everybody on Facebook got a podcast. And it's not, it's not of a growth level that goes back to where your reputation needs to, to be. That's why I said everything is about analyzing where you need to be. I, I play Twitter because I play Twitter because I know on Twitter I can sell fast. So if I'm looking to sell a book every hour, I play Twitter. If I know I'm looking to connect with people who are buyers of my material, I have to go to LinkedIn. If I'm here to engage and because I just want to, I can never do something like this on LinkedIn. It doesn't work, right? I can't do that because on LinkedIn, they'll be like, so why are you telling everybody what they shouldn't do? Because we don't want them to know. It's a secret club on LinkedIn. So those kinds of things, you just have to know where you're separating. And of course, on Instagram, it's just to show the results. So you just have to know where you're playing. And like I said, these are the things you don't want to do. You don't want to sit around in 2020 and thinking, again, how do I get started? How do I put myself out there? What should I do? What, you know, who do I contact? Should I contact a literary agent? Should I contact this person? What publisher should I contact? You've got all of these resources, but if you're sitting on one place trying to sell one book a day and you can't prove the numbers, it gets really difficult. So let me go to my most important stance that I took here today. Learn to sell in bulk. Because if nothing else works in our conversation of what not to do, if nothing else works, if, if the 
selling your life story doesn't work, if, if not having a media plan doesn't work, if nothing else works, if you know how to sell bulk orders of books, you're in. Like, you, you're really in. And it's not hard to sell bulk orders of books. It really is not. You just have to go to reputable places that are looking for reputable people, reputable speakers, or even reputable organizations, and literally sell the masses. Because book publishers, all they want to know is the ROI on their money. So if you've already shown them, I have a book in the market already, and I've sold bulk orders, they were ready to start buying because they're buying into the person who was able to achieve that. They're not buying into the person who is going to do a book a day every day until whatever. So you got that 24 month run, sell a book a day till you all sell out. Um, content, it has to be so different. You can't have the same content on Facebook and LinkedIn. You can't. <clears throat> a lot of times people just like to rehydrate the same content between all platforms. There's some things, yeah, I do rehydrate from one to the other, but for the most part, my LinkedIn profile is not the same as my Facebook profile. And many of you are not on my LinkedIn profile because this is where you play. And maybe your audience is here. Maybe you're more of an engager. I'm not. I want to be with the people who are making the decisions and it happens to be on LinkedIn. So I avoid engagement to go to where I can have conversations on a different level. That doesn't mean one is better than the other. That just means I know what I want. And so I'm very, very assured and confident in what I want. If you're not sure, you have to learn how to play each one till you figure out which one is working or going to work for what you really need. But when you're in the publishing scheme, LinkedIn is going to have to work because that publisher is on LinkedIn. That my publisher right now is on LinkedIn. They friended me on LinkedIn. I'm like, oh, so you're paying attention. That's why I said they're looking at you. And so if you're wasting time on platforms that don't make sense, don't make money, don't make an ROI, and they're looking at you and they're saying, well, why, why, why are you wasting time? Like, you know, that's when they start getting a little bit like worried because you promised them that you had a 24 month marketing run. You promised them you have media coverage. You promised them a lot of things and you sitting out here going on a podcast that only has four people in the entire podcast. So that's really about it. Any other questions? Have I, have I, have I given y'all some value? Um, <clears throat> I tried the paid version of LinkedIn, Vinny. Um, I don't see the value other than being able to get into people's in-mail. If there's not, no other value I see is just the in-mail. Sometimes that could be a little bit like, I, I, so I had the paid version and I canceled it because at that point I didn't need the in-mail. But then decision makers started going premium and then you can't get in their email. So I'm like, oh, I got to go back to, you know, so I, I'd say the main, the main benefit is that if you need that in mail, um, and sometimes you really do, if you need that in mail, go for premium. If you see somebody who you really want to connect with and you need to get in their email, go for it. But if, if not, then I don't see the difference, but, um, yeah, that email is is it's it's bananas because you can get in with so many people through that email. It's just, it's it's bananas. All right, <clears throat> I'm gonna enjoy Saturday, but <clears throat> make some money in 2020. Make some money, like don't waste this time sitting around waiting for that $600 <laughs> a week check. Like it's not it's not cute. Put some money in the bank. You can get paid for your story. You don't need a huge following to do this. All you have to do is have a plan. How are you going to get them back the ROI of what they've given you? And how are you going to ask for what you're really worth? I'll deal with that another time. We'll talk about that some other time soon. But if nothing else, I just want you to be very clear on what not to do. So for those of you who are sitting around trying to think, I'm going to, I'm going to self-publish again, I thought I was going to do the same thing. But um, I, don't have the, I don't have the will I think what happened between me in 2015 and 2018 is I simply didn't want to self-publish again. It's a hard thing to do. It's It took me more time to publish the book than it was worth. And by the time you finish giving birth to this thing, you're like, oh, I did all of this for this. Like, you're so tired. Um, 
as opposed to let somebody else do the work for you, let them pay you for your value, get out here, market yourself, get in more reputable places. Oh, wait a minute, get a bigger speaking market. Like, hello, stop speaking on um, the smaller stages that make you more comfortable. Get out of this comfort zone of, I'll take this because I know I can get this. Like, get into bigger spaces, get with big organizers, start telling them you have this book coming out, let them work with your publisher the whole time, They let them start buying the book, and let them start paying you in book dollars. Bulk orders matter. Bulk orders matter. It matters. It matters a lot. It matters right now. Even if you have a self-published book right now in the market, it matters now. It matters right, right now. Because if you can't prove it now, you're not going to be able to do it when they say, well, what's your plan to sell bulk orders? Well, I'm going to sell it to the same organizations I've always worked with, but nobody's ever bought those books then. So you have to start working on this now. And if you put yourself in a position of getting serious now, when it's time for you to pitch to a publisher, you won't have the same issues that I had when I said, I simply don't have nothing to write about. I had something to write about. I just didn't want to do it because I kept sitting here and saying, ah, I don't want to do it. I was like being a baby. I don't want to do it. And she said, well, how much money do you need? And I made her a, a number and she said, oh, that's, that's easy. We could do that. And I said, oh, for some reason I feel inspired. I feel inspired. My, I feel very inspired. <laughs> see how I could be incentivized easily. <laughs> um, no, no, Simone, they don't buy self-published books. Um, <clears throat> and you don't want them to buy self-published books because they're buying them from, okay, how the process works, I, I can't, um, uh, the, 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 the Baker and Taylor, that's what it's called. You got to go to Baker and Taylor and sell your books there and they sell it to the bookstores for you. That's Again, this is what self-published authors have a tendency to do. They call the bookstore directly. The bookstore is not interested in a self-published book. Baker and Taylor then has to be the intermediary. You have to call them. You have to send them a copy. They'll read it. If they think that it's worth something, they will then say to you, Okay, we'll try to get it in five stores just to see how it does, or 10 stores to see how it does. And they're the ones who will broker that deal, but you cannot, you can't sell your book directly to a bookstore because they, there's no ISBN number that they have in their category to be able to sell it for you. So you have to know how to get in contact with Baker and Taylor, get them to, to take the book from you, take a look at it, they'll review it, and they're not editors. All they're telling you is whether they think it will sell and what category will sell in, you want it or you don't want it. That's it. Um, but Baker and Taylor is expensive. And if you are strapped for cash, it's not a good move because they are going to want you to supply a specific amount of books in order for them to do that. So they may say, okay, we'll take the book. We need, I'm just giving an example. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you this is a definitive number, but they'll say you have to give us 5,000 physical copies. You've got to come up with all 5,000 at the same time. There's no payment plan. And then when you give them the 5,000 copies, they make no guarantee. What they'll do is they'll actually mitigate it through their distribution to sell it to the, the, the bookstores themselves. If the bookstore picks it up, fine. If they don't, they send it back. You may end up with a few copies and back in your hand. So you got to get through Baker and Taylor. That's one of the um, reasons why they don't um, bookstores, yeah, Baker and Taylor, that's what it's called. Because I was sitting around here trying to remember what was the name of the thing called. It's literally the only distribution you're going to find in a bookstore. Baker and Taylor are the only people in the entire, well, the, I'd say they're the only people in the United States and Canada that broker books between book publishers and authors to bookstores. The, nobody else does. That's why getting a publisher is very a very good idea. You don't have to talk to them. Somebody else does all that work for you. Baker and Taylor is the only distributor that I could think of that goes, they go between Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Books A Million. They go between all the big guys. And in Canada, I forgot the one in Canada's name. I could see it on the top. It's a red thing. I think it's called On Site or something like that. They do all of that bidding for you. But again, the, if you're going to call them, you better have money. Because the minute that they say they want to see it, they don't want to see one copy. They are going to ask you, send us 10,000 copies, 5,000 copies, whatever it is, and let's see if it'll work. We'll do an ad run of 10 stores and see if, if it doesn't work, fine. If it does work, fine. And you have to keep supplying it. So you have to keep pumping it out. 
if it doesn't work, then they said, send it back to you. That's just, it's just a risk you're going to have to take. But, um, I haven't seen too many self-published authors be successful at Baker and Taylor because it's a very expensive process. Um, it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars to do business with them because that's the reason why <laughs> you go with a publisher. They got the money, so let them do it. You don't have to do all that work. All right. I'm going to enjoy my Saturday. Um, I just want you guys to think bigger, you know, that, that, that's it. Like, I don't, I don't need you to sit around here and doing it small, not too much longer. It's just 2020. We're in the third quarter. Some of y'all are still playing your 2018 best. It's like, it's time. Like, you still doing that? Um, we've got to grow out of that. And there's so much upside and opportunity out here. I, I sometimes feel as though people are missing it because the doom and gloom of the economy makes you feel as though there's nothing out here to do. There's a lot of upside opportunity if you know how to play the game the right way. Um, you know, between real estate, publishing, speaking, there's a lot of money out here. It's just that people are missing it because they're crying. And I understand why, because we are in the middle of a health crisis of uh, enormous magnitude. Like, I don't think we'd ever have planned for this. But at the same time, if you focus on the distraction of what's going on in the world, you will not find all that is well and meaningful for you to be able to flourish from. And right now, the reason I'm being very silent, quite honestly, is because I'm flourishing and I'm working strategically on something that I never thought I would do, especially right now, is just, all I have to do is just write. I don't have to do anything else. I am not obligated to do anything else. I just have to write it, hand it off to them. They do all the zhuzhing and the zhuzhing and the zhuzhing. They gave me my check and moving on. I don't have anything else to do. So while everybody else is out here, let me let me teach you how to coach. Let me teach you how to this. I I don't want to I don't want to participate. I'm not I'm not participating in the noise. I'm, I I just I completely am not participating in the noise of um, anything. I'm, I'm just, I don't have to. I, I just I've chosen the side I want to be on. I've chosen the side of history I'm going to stand on. And at the same time, I also have a fiduciary commitment to myself my family, my team, people that work for me, and that's what I want to do. I'm not going to sit around here and be like, oh my God, because of COVID, I can't go outside. Well, because of COVID, I get to sit at home for six months and write and get paid for it. Lots of money. <laughs> it's really simple. So I just told you what not to do. One of these days, we'll talk about what to do, but let's just get you out of the what not to do first, and then we'll get you into what to do. Enjoy your Saturday. I think that was simple. <laughs> See you guys soon.